I'll open it up with the first question of the panelists. Can uh, comment on sort of using number of tasks as a measure of scale. Can you comment on the largest scale jobs you've run recently and on the ones you typically see being run uh, with your software? And yeah, go ahead and start with Zanya. In the past? Yeah. Uh, okay, better. Uh, so we've run uh, up to a million tasks, but not recently. Recently, the, the largest we've run on has been about 400K. I showed some of these results. Um, I think what I'm actually more excited about is that we're starting to run on the Sierra machine on the GPUs there. And uh, just last week, we ran on 1,000 GPUs. Uh, and and you know that's, that's much more difficult, because those nodes are much more difficult to uh, take advantage of. <coughs> Okay, um, I've showed you the one that was probably the biggest r run I'm aware of for Hyper, where we actually used up to over a million cores on Sequoia. Um, usually people don't run it quite that big. Um, they maybe use tens of thousands of cores, some MPI tasks underneath. So, um, And yes, we are also trying to get started to do something with GPUs. <coughs> so for us, the uh, size of the problems we solve were much higher level, so our tasks are bigger, so it's a PDE solve. So we scale up to the size of the PDE that people actually want. So we've run on all of Titan for Fusion applications, for example, uh, in various configurations. So how many, how many cores is that on Titan? <sighs> I think they used half the machine. I don't remember exactly how many cores okay. that is, right. but they regularly, regularly use half the machine. Okay. So uh, recently, we run on the, also on the Titan. Uh, the strong scaling we demonstrated could be 30,000, 40,000 cores. And that's probably, I don't know, several, a couple of thousand nodes. And each node is using one GPU, so together. Okay. And typically, for direct solver, people use maybe a few thousand cores. Does your code take advantage of the, of the new large vectorization un, uh, vector units that are now available, for example, in KNL? Yeah, uh, specifically, actually, we are uh, using, uh, KNL has the uh, vector hardware instruction for uh, indirect uh, load. So we uh, modified the code a little bit to, to take advantage of that. And that we see on each node is actually get uh, maybe 20, 10 to 20% uh, performance gain, just uh, per node, using, being able to use this uh, hardware vector load. So for us, Petsy has got an effort underway to do optimizations for the KNL architecture. So there's new matrix classes that are coming online and may already be available to take advantage of the KNL architecture. Barry could tell me if I'm wrong, though. So um, we are not, I'm personally not really running on the KNL. That's not really our target machine at this point. Um, so whatever, uh, there might be some parts which take advantage of it, but I wouldn't really know right now, so. Uh, so for MFM, the answer is no. We don't do anything explicit for KNL. We've run on KNL just the regular code, but uh, there's no explicit intrinsics for that. We have some intrinsics for vectorization on CPUs, but not on KNL. For us, it's also not a target. So I'm unlikely to ever run a calculation on a million nodes, and I wonder how your code, if your codes would be applicable or like efficient to run on hundreds to thousands of nodes. You mean nodes or cores? Or cores, cores. Okay. Hundreds to thousands of cores. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they said I had to go 90 seconds, so yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, uh, so, you, so you, I think routinely a lot of these codes are used up at, at, at those scales and above, uh, or in, in many, many of the p packages you've seen have. Did I see someone else with their hand in the back? Okay. So today we saw a couple of times, for example, in the finite element uh, talk that you scaled up to, say, half a million of MPI tasks on half a million of cores, so the number of MPI tasks equals the number of cores. Um, when I've seen um, results in, in massive scaling before, it was typically a hybrid uh, model of MPI plus OpenMP, where you use one or two MPI tasks per node to reduce the memory footprint. So maybe you could comment on that if you thought about it and, and what your um, ex yeah, just experiences are with both models. So we do have a, a, a mixed uh, 
hybrid uh, model of uh, MPI, OpenMP, plus uh, CUDA right now for GPU. Uh, in our experience, uh, usually uh, we try to use, uh, we need to use as many MPI as possible, and then not to use too many threads, because the thread performance, uh, at least in the sparse code, is uh, not uh, very optimized yet. For example, I'll give you the example of KNL, it has, uh, you can use the 64 threads, right? But one MPI using 64 threads is a lot slower than, say, 16 MPI using four threads per MPI. I'm not gonna wade into the MPI open MP debate. <laughs> Let Barry do that. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, <clears throat> for us, um, Hyper does have both MPI and open MP. As a matter of fact, way back when we started with open MP, we put it in there because at that time you could only do a thousand MPI tasks and not anymore, but we needed to use more. Um, we didn't really, and lately we have looked into it again to try it because it is important for the memory reason. That's an issue. Communication is, by the way, another issue, particularly as algebraic multigrid. I mean, you saw the communication issues we have. If you can use less tasks, then there is less conflict. So there definitely were um, cases in the past where we did get better performance on certain machines where the networks weren't that good um, using OpenMP with MPI. Generally, MPI only um, works better because there's more parallelism there the way it's constructed. Um, but even now, um, in the context with um, GPU right now, Hyper, it's a setup, is still performed on the CPU. And um, <clears throat> so there are actually times where it's good we can actually use threading on the CPU to make up for the fact that sometimes we use four MPI tasks for four GPUs. Um, and that would make the setup super, super slow. So, so yes, there are a lot of reasons why we wanted to use both. And yes, there are also cases where um, many MPI tasks just um, will cause problems. So it's good you can use OpenMP underneath. All right, so we also have OpenMP and MPI, but we never actually have used the OpenMP in production runs. Um, uh, I know that there are simulations where that pays off, but for us, the, the benefit has never been more than like 20% or something. Um, I think it's a much, um, so, so even on KNL, you can, you can probably scale all the way down uh, just using MPI, uh, and people have shown that. I think it's much more interesting question how you mix MPI tasks with GPUs, for example, and how many MPI tasks you need per GPU. So I spoke to a bunch of people uh, regarding putting their code on KNL, and uh, none of them are very happy. They are they ha they are saying that they have to uh, you know optimize their code. So my background is uh, MPI, uh, MPI applying MPI one sided on graph analytics. Uh, so it's kind of difficult for me to actually uh, you know uh, to uh, to optimize on KNL. But I see a lot of people they are unhappy with KNL because it seems they have to do a lot of optimizations. So I want to know your, uh, you know, uh, what is your experience with KNL? How easy or how hard it has been? And wh what do you think is missing? Or what do you think uh, you would want uh, to do in your code to, op you know, optimize your code to the fullest extent? Thanks. Uh, well, so for KNL, I don't have any experience. Uh, I've also heard that people are having, um, that it's not a straightforward thing to get a uh, performance. Uh, for GPUs, it's a completely different world. And so you, you, you have to very much rewrite your code, at least key kernels. But I don't have experience with KNL. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I don't really have experience with KNL either. I know there are people who have tried it on um, KN Hyper on KNL, and I've heard some complaints about their um, scalability issues. Um, which we usually don't see on other machines as bad as that. <laughs> so um, yeah, GPU is, is it's the thing that's our focus right now, try to get to GPUs. And as I said before, um, the setup is really hard to put on GPUs because it's just too complicated. Um, <clears throat> and we'll take new algorithms actually optimally to really get something done. And the solve phase, we do have a version that is actually performing on the GPU. So, but again, even for that, um, you need you need very big problems so it pays off because the overhead is just very large and moving things between CPU and GPU is another issue. So, I also don't have any direct experience porting code to KNL and getting performance out of it. 
Uh, so there's not a whole lot that I can say. Uh, hopefully, if you use good libraries, the libraries will be optimized at some point and it'll become easier. But right now, they're just not there yet. I have only 90 seconds. Oh, no, yeah, uh, well, yeah, as a yeah, we, we, uh, I'm just saying, <laughs> we actually have a lot of experience uh, with uh, KNL. So you were mentioning about uh, the uh, graph algorithm, right? Uh, so the, the thing is, uh, with the KNL, you, so one thing I mentioned earlier is uh, recon, uh, using, try to use this indexed, uh, hardware indexed load uh, uh, store, which helps a lot. Another thing is, uh, for graph algorithm, you may want to consider using the comp blast. Have you heard about the combinatorial blast? So change the graph algorithm in, into some uh, linear algebra operation. And then uh, a lot of this uh, linear algebra operation is already optimized uh, in, you know, in uh, Kublas, uh, et cetera. Uh, so that's one, one thing. And another thing is uh, for graph algorithm, is it, very, it's, it is indeed difficult. For example, for direct solver, all we have been optimizing is for the numerical phase. We get a speed up about uh, almost 2x on one node. But for the ordering phase, uh, like minimum degree in acid dissection, they are actually about a factor of two or maybe even more slower than on CPU. But we haven't got around to look into them. Well, so, so I have a, I have a follow-up question to that one, though. So uh, what, about, what about libraries like uh, Cocos or Raja or Legion or some of these other performance portability layers? Do you have, any of you have experience or can comment on whether or not those per, perhaps offer some paths forward in these, these directions? I'm, I'm not sure whether they are trying to do any, you know, this requires a very fine-grained parallelism vectorization. I think a Legion, for example, is mostly task uh, runtime system scheduling or something, my impression. I, I'm not sure about Coco, whether they do some, this low level of vectorization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so we do have some experience with Raja, uh, and I, I know many people have been successful with Cocos. I think there is a place uh, for these libraries uh, to be used. Uh, it depends how much performance you want to extract and at what level. You mentioned that you, you use MPI plus uh, GPUs. So I wonder if you um, have you uh, configured your MPI to be CUDA aware and uh, how much e performance you can gain from this uh, reconfiguration. Can, can you clarify what you mean by that, GPU direct? Um, for example, um, Open MPI has, uh, you can make it uh, CUDA aware so that uh, you, you don't have to move, uh, for example, your, your array from GPU to CPU and then pass it to um, MPI send or so on. Right. So I wonder if you have uh, experience with a CUDA, M CUDA aware MPI. So this is supposed to work on, on our machine Sierra as, as well as I imagine on Summit. Uh, uh, and I can't say that we have. Um, seen that in practice. Uh, certainly the, the code is there and, and it's supposed, the GPUs are supposed to communicate directly. As you know, on these machines, you want to put all the computations on the GPUs. The performance is, 90% of the performance is on the GPUs. So you want to communicate directly from the GPUs when possible. Uh, and GPU Direct is supposed to accelerate that, but I can't say we've seen that yet. Now we, we're just in the beginning of experimenting with it. So that, you know, don't draw any conclusions, but it's supposed to, to work. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to Sanyo because we're in a similar situation um, with that. We're trying to use Sierra and things are still floating a bit. I mean, they're still working on setting things up and getting all stabilized. And so at this point, we don't know. Uh, okay, so so in our code, because we started uh, developing this uh, CUDA code uh, a few years back, uh, I, I don't know about the OpenMPI CUDA aware feature. So currently we're doing manually, uh, there's a shift, uh, sh ship uh, sub matrices from uh, CPU to device and then ship back. It's a manual thing. But uh, so if your working set, you can fit into GPU memory. Right now each card, I think they can get uh, more than 10 gigabyte or something. Then you can, you probably do everything very fast there. But in our case, uh, since we need a lot of memory, so we need to use both the CPU and GPU. We try to develop the uh, pipeline, the mechanism, while, while the data is uh, transferring to GPU, CPU is still doing some computation. And similarly for KNL, if your working set, uh, you can fit into this uh, high bandwidth uh, memory, H, uh, MCD RAM, is that called? 
it's uh, how many, 16 gigabyte or something. So for a lot of applications, especially if you're running on large number of nodes, then each node can fit. But in our case, uh, very often, you know, direct server takes so much memory, it doesn't fit. So then our band, uh, performance bound, if you look at a uh, roof line model, it's in the end, it's bounded by the, uh, uh, the DRAM, it's not, uh, you know, it's not uh, taking advantage of the four times uh, better bandwidth uh, of uh, HB uh, high bandwidth memory. So if you can fit on the HB uh, high bandwidth memory, then it's better. You get a much better performance. Were you, were you uh, shaking your head because you had a follow-up to that, Daniel? Um, yeah, th there's this, this one caveat that, that Sherry mentioned. Um, um, if you, you want to use the GPUs if their memory is enough. But if you need more memory, and a lot of these nodes have a lot of memories on the CPUs, then you have to think about how you split your data model, who communicates with whom. In that case, it might be more efficient to ship things to the, uh, to the host and communicate with MPI from there. So on the new NVIDIA Tesla P100 architecture, there's, um, there's a hardware feature called a half precision instruction. I'd like to know if any of you have used that instruction for your application code or solvers, okay. and if you have any performance gains from that. Uh, so we haven't. Um, we know the hardware is there. Uh, this is one example where there's a hardware feature that it's not obvious, it's beneficial for the algorithm, but it's there, so let's see how we can use it. Uh, some people are trying to think of creative ways of using it. We haven't used it right now. <coughs> well, we haven't used it either. Although, I mean, there in Hyper, we actually have put some um, changes so that you allow you to actually use less precision for Hyper, to use it in some ways as a preconditioner. We have not connected a solver to that, so, so you can't really use that yet. Um, but um, down the road, that's probably something we should look into, except for the part that the big portions in Hyper we can't actually run on the GPU yet. So I'm not sure how much that really relates to what you were saying. So, yeah. so I have also not used half precision arithmetic. Uh, however, if you do it within a solver, you have to be very careful, especially if it's time dependent, because you know, you're talking all the accumulated round off error and truncation error is really going to mess you up. Uh, so I, I would see it as maybe storing things like the matrices in half precision and doing matrix vector products where the vector is, say, floating point or double precision is probably what you're going to do. You'll pay a cost in terms of convergence, though. So you won't be able to converge as fast. But you'll still get a linear rate of convergence or something like that. So uh, I'm not sure whether Jack uh, talks about this. Uh, do you remember whether he talks about this last week? He, their group actually do, uh, does a lot of these uh, mixed precision. We also do something like uh, in direct solver, for example, you uh, do the factorization, et cetera, in lower precision, but you use uh, double the precision to do the iterative ref refinement, just a few steps. It's, uh, and we have a good analysis for that. But I think uh, Jack's group, they probably do a little more using the mixed precision. So, so a follow-up to that on the, on the topic of precision. Are you aware of cases, uh, problems, science questions that you've tried to use so your software on where you've had to go to quad precision to get useful results out? And if so, can you comment on that? So I certainly have had to go. I've used RPREC for arbitrary precision and had to go up to like 1,000 digits in some examples. Uh, they're not actually very hard examples. This was on like a single processor machine. So yes, there are cases where I've had to go to quad or even higher precision uh, for some fairly simplistic problems on a, even on my laptop. Was that for an optimization problem, Todd? That was for an optimization problem. So this was for a bi-matrix <laughs> game. And you can get some cycling going on in the algorithm itself. And it occurs quite frequently. So I wanted to prove that it wasn't due to numerical precision, and it really was the math theory that was breaking down. So I went to 1,000 digits. Yeah, so I'm not aware of any. Uh... Uh, we haven't used more than double either. Okay. I saw Sherry shaking her head. Did you? Did, uh, uh, I can make some comments. Yeah, so, so we have AirPrec uh, uh, as 
arbitrary precision, we also have double-double, which is 128, and quad-double, which is 256. So it's getting you know a little specialized, it's much faster. Uh, in terms of application, we um, help people use uh, in the climate modeling code, when they do different, uh, uh, how do you say, different component, like uh, ice model, the land model, atmospheric model, different model when they need to couple together, very often the scales uh, vary too widely. So needs to use uh, sometimes double, 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 sometimes quad double. And in the astrophysics uh, people, they needed to use uh, more than double. So those are the two applications that we have been helping with. Given the uh, scalability limitations of sparse direct solvers, um, how do you see the role of such solvers in the future um, in, in the context of exascale computing? So in the context of four million uh, cores, we don't use a direct solver to solve to, to use the entire machine. That's why in my talk I gave you this uh, little block uh, Jacobi preconditioner pre kind of uh, usage. So you, it's, it's like a domain composition, right? You use direct solver only for the subdomain. The global problem, you use uh, you know, iterative solver or you know, anything. And also for the hy uh, hyper, I mean the multi-grid, when you get to the coarser grid, you can use direct solver. So the reason the value to get direct solver as scalable as possible is uh, your multi-level algorithm, you can stop at the uh, media, intermediate level. You don't go, need to go to very coarse grid. So intermediate level, say, for example, you get to several million degree of freedom, then maybe you can ask uh, an efficient uh, direct solver to take care of that. In Maxwell problems, the neural null space is proportionate to the size of the problem. It's huge. And so for problems like that, uh, especially if you're doing something like indefinite Maxwell, for which there is no scalable multigrid algorithms currently, uh, the, 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 the error modes that you are not addressing on fine grids will remain on the coarse grids. And this is a type of problem where you will have to have a large coarse grid in order to catch those modes. And so this is a type of problem where a combination of several levels of multigrid with a coarse grid solve that is direct and at the relative large size makes a lot of sense. Okay, I've got, I've got one, just kind of a fun one. What's like the nastiest, baddest bug that you've ever encountered that like just kind of uh, kept you up at night, took you forever to figure out, and then you, any, any of you have any stories like that? It's always stupid bugs where we write outside of a memory, and in the debugger it works correctly because it gets initialized correctly, but then it just crashes outside of it, and they're always impossible to find. So it's, it's always the stupid ones, and then I can always never figure out how to get the... What is it, the memory checker thing to work because it's always broken on a Mac? <laughs> <laughs> or how about bugs that have only manifested for you at insane scales and, and then are very challenging? I like the ones that occur randomly and <laughs> they randomly <laughs> crash my code. Those are like really hard to find but, uh, and drive me nuts. Did you have a story, Ulrika? Well, well, I mean, we certainly did have at some point a bug where um, this was um, in um, actually in the in one of our AMG benchmarks we had, where we actually had special um, special definitions for um, global variables. So we only would turn the global variables into 64-bit integers, and the rest we stayed 32-bit integers, and I think we forgot one of them. And of course, this one you don't really notice until you run at a very large scale. Mm. And um, fortunately, we do have some very good debugging tool, and um, they were able to actually figure this out at some point with the debugging. They were actually really excited about it because they had a very good example. Can you mention the could, tool? What was yeah, the name of the tool? Stat, yeah, oh, it was okay. stat, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So they were able to actually debug at a really large scale and um, for them it was a blessing, so to speak. Um, all right, uh, I'm trying to think of something new that I didn't say last year. Uh, no, I do. Uh, so, um, <laughs> so one thing, uh, just a general advice is, uh, to f um, if you have a check, uh, to make sure that the bug is not in the check itself. Uh, that, 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 that has happened many times to me. Um, 
so uh, one example I gave it also last year, but um, this was a long time ago before there was uh, const arguments uh, in C functions. And uh, I had a function that was the operator evaluation, and uh, it was AX, you know, Y equals AX. Uh, and for some reason, for, you know, it was a complicated operator. So for some reason, it, that uh, function changed x. And x was not declared to be const. So the, it, changed, it changed the input of, uh, of its evaluation, and that just took forever to find, because uh, you would never suspect that. As a follow-up question on the debugging tool, I know that you guys use debugging quite a lot. So what debugging code do you recommend code or code or program do you really recommend for someone like us that don't deal with parallelization a lot? So on my old Sun workstation, there was, I think, DBX, which was really awesome because it did all the memory checking for me. Uh, and you don't get that these days, as far as I know. Yes, we did have Purify on the Sun chase, which helped you with the memory. I, just, I still like Total View, even for um, sequential codes, because it helps you really look into your code. But of course, it's really good for parallel codes, if they're not too big. <laughs> yeah, so we at Livermore, we have a license for Total View, and we're kind of spoiled. I think other people are using, I think it's DDD successfully these days. Um, I think that also may need a license, though. So I. People still use G2B. Did you want to comment, Sherry? Uh, just to say, GDB, GDB, GDB is a very good uh, GNU environment. And using GDB, you can even do the parallel debugging. Yeah. I mean, small scale. Yeah. So um, you mentioned about the uh, spatial um, multi grid method. Um, have you have any experience on the time domain uh, multi grid method or like uh, any implementation on it? So are you talking about multi-grid in time or yeah. multi-grid yes. in time? Yes, multi-grid in time. Okay. Yeah, so we do, we, do we, we do have experience with that. In, in, in Livermore, we have a project called Braid. It involves actually a lot of people on the hyper team. And that does uh, multi-grid in one dimension, essentially using the time stepper as a black box. And we also have software for that. For time-dependent problems, do you do any space-time 4D, basically, simulations? Uh, that, that's an excellent question. I think uh, that's definitely of um, great interest. And we, some people are using uh, MFM, for example, to do that. We do have a branch where we have 4D elements, including 4D simplices. Um, I think it's still a little early for this. Um, I think high order is still yet to prove itself, and then, then that's even more expensive. Um, you know, ideally, what you want to do is. Uh, Unstructured meshing in space time with adaptive mesh refinement in space time, maybe even curved meshes and mesh optimization in space time. But, uh, but yeah, that's something of interest, not an immediate active area for us. Could you comment on um, which fraction of the human time of the developers goes into um, developing new features, um, <coughs> and maintaining the code, um, improving the performances of existing code, like? getting a higher fraction of the peak performance of the architecture you're using. And uh, actually, I would be interesting, just out of curiosity, uh, for your libraries, uh, what percentage of the peak performance of the um, architecture you managed to reach? So I would say we use a lot of our time to develop new features and do performance improvements. And we spend a lot of time debugging and fixing and updating the code to make sure it's all correct. So I can't tell you what we percentage of peak we get off the top of my head because I don't know. So you could ask Hong or Barry and they could tell you. <clears throat> so as far as the percentage of peak, I can't really tell you either. We usually don't look that much into it. Multigrid methods for sparse problems are usually not that super great, I mean, compared like to dense problems or so. So it's probably not that high. We really just concerned, however, on trying to make sure that we get the lowest times we can achieve um, for our customers. So, um, so we do spend um, quite a bit of time trying to optimize 
and we also try to come up with new methods because there are a lot of problems out there when multiple grid methods do not solve yet. And but we believe there are really um, the way to go to exascale is in some kind of multi-level way. So we keep looking into trying to come up with new methods. And we actually have added a few new uh, multi grid methods to hyper recently that specifically address non-symmetric problems. Um, again, they are still in development, and we probably still will keep working on improving their performance. But they are there. So, um, so it, it's not as bad as uh, five percent implementation, ninety-five percent debugging. But debugging plays an important role. I think making uh, with it, it's, it's very important to guarantee that what that your code is correct, uh, because a lot of people will use it in library form. Um, we also spend a lot of time on research, uh, especially on how the methods, developing new methods, testing them. Um, so my, it is my experience that if you, um, the methods that get really good peak performance are probably not the methods that people want to use and the most scalable. So uh, how are the methods, uh, for example, you can implement them very naively um, and you can get a, um, um, memory complexity that is p to the ninth, uh, p to the sixth, and, and flop complexity that is p to the ninth. And if you do them this way, you will get great performance from the machine. You can get up to 80% of the performance of a GPU. But you could, uh, you could be smarter about the math behind it, and you can implement them with memory complexity p to the, Q, p to the third, which is three orders of magnitude less, and flop complexity p to the fourth, which is five orders of magnitude less. And if you implement that method, you'll get 10% of the peak, but it, your code will run faster. And that's what matters. So a, a follow-up to the software engineering question there. Oh, I'm sorry, Sh Sherry, um, did I interrupt you? Did you have a comment to make on that? Um, maybe just a quick okay. comment. So uh, direct server compared to the iterative server, Quilov and the multi-grid, direct server has a relatively higher arithmetic intensity. Uh, thinking about uh, the flops per memory access, uh, you do more flops. Uh, so we, we can actually get uh, a, a little more, you know, fraction of the peak in terms of uh, flop rate. Uh, so it's probably 20, 30 percent for large enough problems. And uh, do, do you want me to comment on software engineering now? Or? Oh, well, I was going to follow, follow up. Uh, yeah, did, did you have a comment about relative uh, effort and feature versus sort of tuning? Uh, yes. So in the past, uh, we were doing the very primitive, uh, you know, the not very good uh, software engineering in terms of releasing code. So it's everything is manual. Uh, we follow some recipe, but sometimes forgot uh, this that. But recently, because of this uh, ideas project you heard about, and then now the XSDK project, uh, the community is trying to standardize, uh, you know, having a compatible um, configure you know, installation process. And then we move the code into to GitHub, for example, and set up CMake. Now, uh, with this uh, setup, actually, the maintenance becomes uh, much less uh, a burden. Before, when there's a, something goes wrong, it requires very you know, manual going, uh, tracing the bug. But now it's much better. And also, the when we have a commit into the GitHub, then there's automatic uh, trigger the testing code to run. So if some something is not right, we know right away, and pretty much we know where the bug is. So it's a, it's a lot more improvement this uh, couple of years. So I see we're coming up on uh, just almost 6.30. So I'd, I'd like to uh, follow up that question with just one more question to ask you. Uh, uh, and that is, you know, a lot of the packages that are represented here have, act, have existed for a long time. In fact, uh, some of them have existed before open source was even a thing. All right. So many, many, many of the packages have gone through the transition uh, from whatever sort of in-house software engineering and software development practices they were doing to sort of getting into the open source community world. So I just wanted to ask each of you if you can comment on aspects of the of the process and transitioning to open source that you felt have been beneficial and maybe some of the things that you felt have been uh, difficult? So there wasn't, um, I should say, Hyper was open source from the beginning. So, um, so there isn't And how, really how long ago was the beginning? 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Yeah, so. Um, so um, there was no. There was no transition. So it was, it's, okay. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so 
um, I don't know if there was a transition, uh, uh, but certainly there was a transition with moving uh, um, to for Google Code. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. There used <laughs> to be something called Google Code, and then to <laughs> GitHub. Um, I think it's um, it, I think it's very important to 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 have uh, your code being public when 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 you have something that you're proud of that you're ready to share with the rest of the world, just like when you prove a theorem and when you develop. A new research idea, you publish it. Uh, it's the same with with the code, and I think that is very beneficial because it forces you, knowing that other people will look at your code. It forces you to be disciplined. It forces you to to uh, it's it's a think of a um, it's a, uh, introduces a measure of quality control, knowing that other people will look and criticize your code, and and so uh, that's an important aspect. It has all sorts of other benefits that are similar to publishing a paper. Other people will see your code. Maybe you will start new collaborations. Uh, maybe you will get other people in your group interested in what you're doing or outside. Uh, and so I think it's hugely beneficial. Um, I really enjoy the, um, all the tools that come with GitHub that uh, have to do with um, regression testing, for example, the community. Uh, the tracking of issues, uh, it, the pull requests, I think it, 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 these are all great things that we didn't have when we, we, we used to just have one directory and everybody will copy and <laughs> it was a disaster. Uh, and so, so you guys, uh, <laughs> yeah, you should, <laughs> you, don't, you don't know how much, uh, yeah, how good you have it. Uh, I can't really think of any serious difficulties uh, uh, maybe the only thing is that when you have a large community, it, it could be sometimes difficult to, to get an agreement and, and people can pull in different directions. It might be difficult to kind of have a shared goal, but that's, I, I wouldn't say that's a really bad thing. Any, any other comments on that topic? I would say probably one of the things that's difficult is when we have to change version control systems. So when we went from like Bitbucket to GitHub to GitLab uh, to all of these other things, I, I think we're in a good position right now. I don't foresee them changing too much later on or from now on, at least in the next five to 10 years. But there used to be this period in the beginning where we would churn through version control systems and that would always be a challenge during the transition. So uh, I'll, we're just about done. I just wanted to make one other comment that I think is unique about the software that you see represented here that you probably won't see ever in commercial industry. But a lot of these packages have been supported by the same people for, for decades. You heard Rika, 20 years on Hyper. I don't know, Barry, how long on Petsy? 24 years. You, you see packages and software that have been developed and maintained by the same, by and large, the same group of people or at least certain members of those teams for decades. You will never see that kind of thing in commercial industry. It's a, so it's um, a lot of experience and expertise in the people that are, that are representing these packages. So let's, uh, let's thank, thank our panel and we can move back for evening hands on.